when John Sharp asked me to um, present, I kind of at first thought, I think I said, oh, so am I the Luddite of the conference? Like, what's that about? And he said, no, no, it's the, the there's, you know, like you had said, there's there, we use these words in common and we have some common goals, but we come at it from very different angles. And what, what John and I had talked about at some point at a, um, a conference at Parsons was um, just even the way that we define play and kind of what we, what our rules are or how we design for instructions. And in my case, being that I um, usually use objects, either um, uh, playgrounds or uh, a space often. I try to design spaces that facilitate play, but they, um, I have to follow the rules of gravity and material. So my instructions tend to be built into the design and the form and the way that something functions. Um, and, and in as much, I actually try to make, in fact, I think all of my designs, I could say, are open-ended um, and child-directed, which means that there's, there aren't instructions um, there are no right and wrong answers, very intentionally. Um, in particular, that's important to me because a child's life is so filled with right and wrong answers and instructions and this idea that there is one way to do something and to do it well and do it right. So um, so in the case of most of the things I design, children, um, they invent kind of the identity of the things that they are uh, playing with through the play itself. So they're designing what it is and what to do with it. And GMO is the white um, construction, yes, Imagination building toy, magnetic, which um, was my first practice of this, and um, and I'll show some other. GMO launched at the uh, New York MoMA Design Store in 2007, and had a bit of a um, global following. It did really well in Japan, and uh, Russia, and and was sold for some time, and integrated into curriculum. Um, in a number of progressive education classrooms and Montessori classrooms in Tokyo. Um, and what I really like about GMO is that if you think of building blocks as being set on, on um, like a geometry and an architecture, GMO would be based on the, the human body and cellular structure. So when kids play with GMO, they put it on their bodies almost automatically. And back to the part of the, they, you invent what it is that you're playing with, they, I, I get pictures still, and GMO's actually been off the market for over a year now, but I still get pictures from people that send me photos saying, look at what my kid did, have you ever seen this? You know, and it'll be whatever they, whatever thing they've built. But, but it's really, really common that people think like, I discovered how to do this, and that's perfect. Often also they do, I, I didn't necessarily think of everything that, could, that GMO could do. But I get some great photos of things, and that makes me very happy. It had, it had kind of an interesting life. Um, in the toy industry, which is a whole nother story. But the toy industry is, I think, very different from at least what I've seen with the indie game industry, in that we definitely don't sit around and critique each other's work in a super productive way, which I saw happening last night, which was really fun, and everybody collaborating to help and make everything great. Like, that is, does not happen in the toy industry. The, the, um, the toy building in Manhattan actually for many years, and it's now moved, but I think up until the 50s, it had the highest security like of anywhere in all of New York City, higher, in fact, than Wall Street or any of the um, government buildings. The toy industry building was like in complete lockdown because of intellectual property. And so that like set the tone for the industry in a way that's very unfortunate. In, in trying to show what GMO is, because it's um, the other one thing that happens with toys is that if you can't, if it's in a box, of course, and you can't touch it, then you can't tell what it does. And with GMO, it was a trick. So we, some friends and I kept making these little motion, um, little animations and things to try to show that GMO is stretchy, because in the photos, it wasn't coming across as such. People thought it was rigid. So this is an example of one. Uh, so this was an installation of 300 GMO that was in a museum, and I, I built these steel, all these different steel things that it could theoretically climb on. So the, those leather cushions and the GMO and, the, and the, all of the green things are steel, uh, powder-coated steel plates. This was in um, 2005, I believe. Um, so I'm, I, um, I worked for years, uh, for four-ish years with the Rockwell Group, which is an architecture firm in New York City. Um, and they um, decided that they wanted to reinvent the playground. And so we, we kind of came at the project at first just wide-eyed and very curious and, and started doing research on all the playgrounds in the greater five boroughs. And um, eventually 
uh, met up with the right consultants who kind of kept us on track and told us about the wonder and glory of loose parts, which um, uh, being a kid, I was raised in the woods with um, a mom who taught Montessori, so we had no, like my whole life was building blocks and sticks and mud, which I actually think are the, the best toys that anybody can have besides their dog, or sticks and mud. But so um, I, I love blocks, so um, in trying to deal with code and safety issues of code and, and public playgrounds, um, we, you know, we'd say, well, what if, what if we make a, like, why does a slide look like a slide? Let's make it look like it's like a giant monster in the thing. And, but if you call it a slide, then it has to follow the rules of a slide. And in the case of consumer product safety testing, the, the code designs the slide. So it says, if it's a slide, it has to have a pitch like this, it has to have, this. it can't be more than this, it has to be this wide. So literally, it is designed by the code itself, like within a few inches of each detail, you can change it. So then, it took us a while to kind of shake loose of that and finally say, well, what if we just don't call it a slide? Or what if we don't call it a playground? So that bought us a, some space. And um, David Rockwell is incredibly kind of brave, and we, we got the Parks Department, New York City Parks Department on board early enough, and they wanted to be brave. So um, we did a number of rounds of testing. Um, and so these were kind of early prototypes um, of a building system which we were proposing would be the playground itself. So the whole, and this was kind of a second round of prototyping. Um, and then ultimately there was a kind of a flagship site um, which, wound up costing a lot of money. And in the meantime, we kind of found that these loose parts, the, the building blocks, were, had, could, had a potential all their own. Hi, Colleen. We've all, we all introduced ourselves and like chatted a little bit. And now we know that you're in the non-committal section. We've already established that. <laughs> so this is the, the flagship site. But in the meantime, the blocks themselves um, the New York City Parks Department um, really liked the potential of those, and they were seeing these tests and seeing the kids go completely bonkers with these loose parts. And one of the things that was important to me in, in thinking about these was that in, in um, densely urban environments, kids don't get to rearrange their furniture. Like, they don't get to affect space very often. When they're in public, it's, it's not something where they, like, necessarily get to hang out and, you know, move things, and, um, and even in apartments, uh, they're much less likely to be able to make forts and move the table and chairs around, right? So I, I wanted there to be a number of parts that were, that were so big that the, the children could come, like, not just make a space that changed throughout the day, but actually like, move and make something bigger than them. So that was a big um, element of this, and ultimately it wound up being kind of a pop-up playground in a box. Um, and is now deployed in thousands of playgrounds around the world. So that um, partnership, or there was a partnership between Rockwell Group and a company called Kaboom that kind of took it to the world in a way that's been really phenomenal. And I, th I would argue has changed the industry quite a bit. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but in the meantime, back to sticks and mud. Um, as much as I love the blocks and GMO and my, the rigamajig, which is the most recent, um, I still, like as a designer, I feel a little strange about that I have to, that I'm designing objects. Like, I'm not gonna lie, the rigamajig is, they're glorified two by fours. But I also understand that there are some reasons we can't just give kids two by fours. Um, and there's a benefit to giving kids really nice things. And I think it's important to give kids really nice things, particularly really heavy, big things. That's also very important. So um, in the meantime, I work with an organization are, they're now two or three organizations because they have different, um, they're around the world again. But they do these pop-up adventure playgrounds where it's essentially, they bring together as much junk and cardboard and, and sticks and things and, um, and then just let kids go crazy. So we proposed this for the um, South Lawn of the White House through Michelle Obama's um, Let's Move initiative. And we had a number of conversations and I think we got pretty close, but ultimately they were like, there's no way you're gonna bring a bunch of trash onto the cell phone of the White House. No. <laughs> but it was close. I know you can't really see that very well, but that's like kids playing completely immersed in trash, having a ball. But in the meantime, we, um, we've put out a couple publications just telling people like, it doesn't take, you don't need this organization to do this. Like just let your kids play with whatever it is that's around, like give them dirt, like let them go. Um, play happens outside of toys, right? 
Um, and this is a couple examples of these events that we did on um, Governor's Island, where we just, we brought together this stuff. Um, and that there's a, on Governor's Island, there's something called the Figment Festival, which is kind of like Burning Man for families. And so there's, it's, it's really fun. Um, so this was the perfect place for it, and the kids loved it. Um, so leading up to, uh, the Highline approached me and asked me to, uh, they had a number of programs. Uh, the Highline, sorry, the Highline is a um, public park in New York City that's a, um, it's an abandoned railroad. It's an, uh, an elevated railroad that was abandoned for years that was turned back into a park. Um, and it's amazing and uh, very crowded and it's very narrow, but it runs 20 something blocks and, and it's like kind of just a walkway but it's beautiful and has all this nature, and you're, it's quiet, and you're off the street, and it's kind of the surreal Manhattan um, uh, moment. But so they wanted, they wanted some way to engage kids more directly. Like they, they were engaging kids, but not as directly as they would have liked. And, um, but simultaneously, of course, the issues being that there's nature right there, and we'd love to let the kids play with nature, but if, in fact, every kid played with nature, that would be gone instantly, right? So this is a similar problem with a lot of um, why we're seeing fake turf pop up in a lot of pl playgrounds because, you know, 10 feet, 10 little tiny feet running on the lawn, the lawn is fine, but 100 feet later, the lawn is not fine, right? So there's this weird in-between moment where we want kids to have nature, but we also, in densely urban areas, again, it's really tricky. So um, the first few rounds of proposals involved a lot of nature and mounds and rolling hills and things, but it just wasn't realistic. So um, we turned the attention instead to all of the really cool industrial details on the High Lane and um, made, again, another kind of pop-up play kit of loose parts. Um, and in this case, again, glorified two by fours, essentially. But all of them with these funny industrial details that would be prompts. Um, so sometimes it's in the form, like including an arc opens up this kind of abstraction, whereas if you, if we're, you just have the brackets and the corners, you wind up with a lot of structures. But the wheels and these, these arc uh, planks kind of introduce a, a new direction for, for um, the imagination, along with a lot of odd found parts. So, um, oops. So, and pulleys. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an engineering element and a simple machines part with this, which has been kind of great because schools are able to get STEM grants in order to buy it. It's in uh, 32 schools right now that are using it either in their playground or in their curriculum. Um, and a lot of them are tacking it into their STEM curriculum. So they're starting to use it to teach, which is kind of what, that's my ideal for it. Um, and again, so this is a crane. These two brothers were working together and and made, actually, I didn't know how this was gonna work, but ultimately, it worked really well. It, the, the rope pulled this arm up, right, which then lifted the bucket up, and then they could roll it around and convey it. Um, there's it there it is up. And then this one, these two worked together for at least an hour and a half, and, um, and I thought, I was kind of just watching and seeing you know, how intuitive the parts were and which, which things they were kind of struggling with. And ultimately, I asked them to tell me about it. I said, oh, tell me about this. Um, I, I learned early on from one of the um, uh, kindergarten teachers that I worked with at the beginning of the um, Rockwell Group Project, not to, I don't, I don't ask, what are you doing? Because that implies that they, or what are you building? Because it implies that it has to be a thing. Um, and if, if it's what are you building, then it's something that's built, which is a building, not an elephant or an alien, right? So there are all of these like nuances with working with kids that I, I love kindergarten teachers for um, telling me these little ways of like um, being much less intrusive into their imaginations and what it is that they're doing. So anyway, these two were playing forever, and at some point I said, um, when they kind of finished it and brought it out of the mess to take this photo, um, I said, tell me about this. And he, the, the, the little boy, started telling me about that, that it, it's a jet thing and it flies and this is the water ramp and the water goes the thing and then it dissolves before it hits the ground and all this details with the water. And she's sitting there staring at him like he's completely insane. 
And she's like, um, no, that is the trunk, and these are its wings because it's very elephant. And, and she had this whole other theory, but they had played together and cooperating and hold this, let's do that, no, this goes over here. So I never knew that they were, I don't even think they knew that they were, well, I know they didn't know they were building different things, but it was this really <laughs> nice, like, it didn't matter, like, the act of playing was the goal. You know, in the end, they did have visions of what it was, and I loved that their visions were so abstract and strange and invented. Um, so much so that even asking, like, even saying, tell me about this, I, I hesitate because all of a sudden it does, like, th there's this pressure that it needs to be something where it didn't before then. And then there's uh, just, like, again, you can tell, like, sometimes it's just the fun of playing. And then structures. Oh, so um, in intuitive details are designing in. This is something I'm seeing with the games. Like, how do you design success into something? Um, or, or how much, how easy do you try to make something? Or, or at what level do you want to make sure somebody um, experiences success so that they stay in it? So with, with the, um, this was, on the Highland, it was called the Workyard Kid. It's now called the Rigamajig. So I'll probably switch back and forth between the names. But with the, um, with the Workyard Kid, we found that the younger kids, it would take them a while to understand um, kind of lateral stability. So they'd have to make a frame in order to build tall and back to that kids in the city really crave making something that's bigger than them. Um, and that's an incredibly empowering thing. Um, so these, these big blocks that you see were this way, and, and at first they kind of bugged me because I, I thought it was like cheating. I wanted them to figure out lateral stability and, and experiment enough to get something to stand up. But this, they could just walk up and kind of plug it in and instantly have something tall. So there's been, it's been a nice process with the Highline in that I went, for the first summer it was out there and watched and, and was able to observe and learn and then change um, quite a bit or, or add and, and subtract from the design, which is always ideal. Um, and the carts too, they love carts. So now there are a lot more elements that relate to carts. And the parents, the parents, it's, um, uh, I don't think the Highline tries to take the parents out of it, but in, in Manhattan it's a common kind of, the parks are trying to get the parents out of the play because of the helicopter parent, um, I wouldn't say problem, but it's a bit of a situation. Like, can you just like let your kid play? Like, don't tell them how to do that actually. Like, this is where they get to figure it. So we, we try to, um, if, if they are having an, an important, like an engaged moment, say, let the kid be the creative director. You can be the technical director, right? And say, let's make this more stable or let's put that, but let the child be the creative director. So rather than the parent telling the kid, no, go get that one, okay, no, go get that one. Because we definitely see both. Um, so, in bringing it all together as a, as a product, um, after the Highline, it, 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 I had a great feedback, so I spent a, um, well, almost two years now re-engineering and redesigning parts of it to make a product out of this kind of project. Um, so we'll say that the first one on the Highline cost roughly uh, $15,000 by the time we had made a couple prototypes and tested, um, and the, the what I'm calling wing bolts and nuts, those plastic parts, those were made by hand, so they were $35 each. <laughs> they're beautiful, but that's like, you know, they, things do get loved all the way home. So, um, that's what, and, I, and at some point I was like, oh, you guys, we were in a meeting with the Highline, I said, oh, you can put RFID chips in them, and then you can have an app, and you can see where the wing bolts go all over the greater five boroughs, you know, and they were like, that's like, what? No, they were not into it. But anyway, so the, the, uh, in redesigning it, uh, again, I, I kind of tried to figure out what's the perfect number of parts and pieces, how many kids, et cetera. So this is a classroom kit. Um, and then um, I've also noticed that some, not all kids and, and not all teachers are comfortable with no rules. So rather than giving instructions, um, we've come up with different prompts. And so some of these are, uh, as abstract as use the rigamajig to make a friend, um, or build a structure that would allow you to live in a cloud, right? Or um, make a structure that incorporates a balloon in a useful way, right? So, or, you know, and then even there's another section of the instruct well, instruction booklet that says 
tells teachers, you know, set, give everybody, give uh, groups of children the same quantity and just let them go, like maybe just those, that amount of constraints. Um, which is interesting, constraints are like, they're kind of a new favorite thing for me to try to figure out, even as a, as a professor with my industrial design students. There's a balance of constraints and again, like setting th them up to be successful. So, um, talked a little bit about the, the STEM thing and of course, um, maybe is it, if you guys heard of STEAM, STEM to STEAM instead, right? So of course there's the STEAM instead of STEM. But this has been a great, the A is art which I see as creativity. Um, and not just that, not just that um, necessarily that, you know, art should have the same respect as the STEM disciplines, but more that science, technology, engineering, and math all also gain from the creative process. And so back to the, a race to the top, <laughs> thanks to the, yeah. Um, that, that, so much of that is about innovation, right? And, and that the creativity and the, um, the ability to problem solve and tinker and, and fail and try again is, is part of the art process. So, um, I, yeah, I also, I mostly am interested in um, any questions you guys might have. I've, I've been having so much fun, as I mentioned a little bit, but that the, the process, your design process is really, really inspiring to me just in its collaborative nature. Um, but I'm also, again, curious, um, because I, I'm not necessarily aware of the the words that I use differently. I know which you, which words we have in common, but I never know which ones like I use play differently than you do. Right? So, any questions? 